Ains at Level 1. Chapter 30. Written by Dark Paladin 000. Um. Enfirea muttered. His grandmother didn't seem to be all too happy and was tapping her foot in impatience, her sour mood clearly evident. The sun was setting, the two alchemists had planned to arrive at noon but had been delayed and so arrived hours late. This was only part of why Lizzie was so flustered, however. They had come to Khan in order to gather rare plants, which they needed to work on their alchemical research. Unfortunately, they had hit a snag in this plan, for now, the plants which the villagers would have normally collected were nowhere to be found currently. Lizzie asked, what's the holdup? Why aren't the herbs here? We've run out of salamander's tongue and newt's eye. Both of those, contrary to what one might expect, were names of herbs and not animal parts. Enfirea told his grandmother that he would go ahead and speak to the village chief about it. Well that was more Enfirea's excuse just to go ahead and speak with Henry again, but two birds with one stone and all that. Henry was speaking to Thomas the Elder Lick in charge of Kun village, more or less at least. She had been kind of rather busy lately. As a matter of fact, one could even say she was the most busy person in all of Kun village save for perhaps the undead, working tirelessly regarding matters and handling Suzuki's affairs. For her efforts, she had been rewarded. Although she didn't know it because no one in this world could open up a character sheet, she had actually managed to gain three levels in the class of Undead Commander. A job class series that was usually reserved for undead such as the Crypt Lord or Skeletal Lieutenant who commended massive hordes of undead, it was quite odd for a human to get such a job class. But she had managed to obtain it nonetheless. As for now, all she could really do was use the skill Anti-Life Banner, twice a day which was a boost to undead within an area and mitigated their weakness to holy magic attacks somewhat. Hello, Enri, Enfirea said. Enri turned around to see the young alchemist. Hello Enfirea. What's going on? My grandmother and I had just dropped by and I was wondering what happened to the plants. We would usually get the usual herbs readily but today. Enri looked away rather quickly seeming embarrassed. Enfirea himself began to blush at the sight, though, he couldn't really describe why or why he felt like his stomach was doing somersaults and his abdomen. The thing is Enfirea, we've been kind of preoccupied with other things at the moment and we did not have the time to collect herbs like we normally would, but of course, you've been working on some experiments with Suzuki-sama, correct? That's right, Enfirea said. Their progress on the concoction known as God's blood was bearing little fruit up till now though Enfirea refused to give up hope. Well, in that case it would be bad if we weren't able to go ahead and help him with those things. So don't worry. Just give me some time and I'll get someone to get the needed materials. Oh, it's all right, Enfirea said, I don't mind having to stop by an extra day just to find the plants myself. As it was Enfirea wasn't sure that the villagers would be able to find everything he needed. He knew a lot of the plants by his own experience after all. And though she said there's no need for you to bother doing stuff like that Enfirea really had no problem staying back a day though, he had a feeling his grandmother would be rather mad about it. As the two of them bickered back and forth Enri was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a red-headed woman who had a common bow, slung over the back. She was one of the new adventurers who had decided to come to Kun and had decided to stay there for the time being. Henry did not remember her name though as far as she knew this was a copperplate adventurer. Henry had often seen her practicing archery along with some of the other villagers but had never approached her before. What happened? Henry asked. Your grace, the ranger began to say. Henry interrupted her to tell her that honorifics were not needed. Yes, village chief. I'm not the chief, Henry replied. People kept referring to her as that given her sphere of authority had expanded quite a lot in the last few weeks. It did not mean that she was suddenly the village chief though. She was just someone of importance to Suzuki Sartori no, Enri doubted that Suzuki actually needed her, it was just that she had happened to be in the right place at the right time to take on such responsibilities. She did not see herself as being the head of the village, even though it seemed that even the actual village chief seemed to defer to her in many decisions lately. 
Well, what I'm trying to say is there's a strange noise. Ha Henry asked, what do you mean strange noise? The ranger perked up her ear and cupped a hand to her ear. It's very odd. It's like I can barely make it out, but hold on a second. Do you happen to have a glass? Whom? No, I don't, Henry said. The ranger then went and crouched down to the ground, putting an ear to the earth. Yes, I can hear it now. It's strange like rhythmic marching but even louder. As if there's a loud group coming. It almost sounded like an earthquake to her. But at the same time, it was too organized to be something natural. No, it sounded as if there was a large army on the march and after a minute more of listening to the ground, her fears were confirmed. It looked like whatever it was that was causing these strange tremors was moving towards them. Something big is coming, she said though she was still not sure what it was after all. She had heard of stories of giant sandworms, which dwelt below the earth, and created massive tremors wherever they went and earthquakes as well though she had hoped you would never have to live to see them. These were mainly stories of desert earthworms as far as she knew and nothing of the sort had ever been seen in the re kingdom. Granted she was not exactly a very skilled adventurer, and it might be possible that the Adventurer's Guild would have someone more skilled and knowledgeable in such matters than she was. Whom? What should we do then? Enri asked. We could send a message to Suzuki, Enfereya said. That might work, Enri said, but until then I feel like we should do something to help the villagers out. She did not want to be caught off guard. If a giant monster had suddenly appeared to attack them. You know what we should do? We should go ahead and have the villagers gather in a safe area for the time being. What place would be safe? the ranger asked. Henry really wasn't sure given they had no idea what the monster was, what it could do, or its possible capabilities. There was no way to tell which place would be safe. Ideally, she would pick some place where one could not burrow through the ground, unfortunately, their village had no nearby limestone deposits or the such which were very difficult to dig through. She had heard of several castles in the re which were built on rock deposits that could not be tunneled through making it impossible for miners, to sap them in the case of the siege or for them to be otherwise attacked from below. Unfortunately, no such options existed for them. The elder leiches just could perhaps fly, but they were limited in the amount of people they could take. Whom? Perhaps you could have each of them grab a carpet and raise several people up. No, there was no way that you could possibly get everyone in the village safe like that. Before she could go ahead and think of the possible solution, a scream rose up from the village. The undead immediately went into motion going towards the source of the noise. Henry dashed over to see what it was. With her new levels, she was actually able to outpace both the ranger and Emphorea who was left panting as he tried to catch up. There was a villager woman who had a gash on her forearm, a strange creature now decapitated was lying before her. It looked like a strange sort of mole person. Enfirea and Enri had not seen anything like this before. Enfi, do you know what this is? No, Neferia answered. He took a deep breath and with the tip of his shoe he prodded its dead body. The ranger as well examined it and confirmed that she had no idea what this was. Around them they heard several more screens indicating that more of these creatures had popped up. What's going on Enfirea? Lizzie asked as she walked by. It looks like we're being attacked, Enfirea said. These strange creatures are popping up. How come you weren't able to hear them this time? Enri asked the ranger. What I heard must have been the main force, she replied. These people, these are just the vanguard village chief. We have to do something. Otherwise, we're going to run into the much larger force very soon. It was then that Henry realized the implication of what was being said. It looked like they would be under attack soon. All right, then gather up the villagers. Just as she said this, all hell broke loose. It turned out that the ranger lady was mistaken on one thing. She had assumed that the approaching army was one that was most likely mainly approaching above ground when she saw the soldier. Given this, her senses had been misled by the army which had been far closer than she had thought, and within minutes, 
the entire Kwagoa army began to burst off from under the ground. The undead of course, were the first to react casting spells left and right or attacking as best as they could, with little to no regard for their own UN lives. Among the humans, it was actually Lizzie who responded first. Lightning, she screamed sending a shock wave through the attacking invader. Although she couldn't read demi-human expressions very well she could see though that the demi-human seemed to withdraw once they saw the attack. Were they possibly weak to lightning? Had she discovered a weakness of theirs? To confirm this she would need to experiment with different kinds of elemental attacks. Unfortunately, lightning was the most powerful spell she knew, and she was unable to cast fireball. Unlike the elder lick around her who had no issues casting fireball again and again. The enemy demi-humans were turned to ash, but there didn't seem to be any end to them. Given this though Lizzie wasn't sure whether that theory was correct, it was possible, though that these demi-humans simply had very low, magical resistance and so any kind of spell was very useful against them. And even if they were weak to lightning attacks, she did not know the electrosphere spell, which would have spelled certain doom for them if they were indeed weak to lightning. They certainly seemed to resist normal weapons however, as a villager attempted to swat one away with a pitchfork, but found that the instrument broke in his arms after a single swing. He screamed as the creature jumped on top of him, only for it to be stopped by Enferea chucking a vial of violet-colored liquid at the demi-human. The creature hissed and backed away as part of its skin seemed to have melted off. This did not manage to kill it however, and it simply turned around with its fangs bared at Enferea and ready to decapitate the boy before his grandmother could finish it off. His grandmother was already panting. She may have tried to look tough and she had no doubt in a formidable mage as an alchemist, in her time, but age caught up to anyone who was human. Now even this drain of casting a third tier spell over and over was catching up to her, and her mana reserves were not equal to that of a dedicated arcanist given she specialized in alchemy. Despite the efforts of the villagers and the undead they had, the demi-humans were able to wreak quite a large deal of havoc. There were simply too many of them. However, as Henry thought that all was hopeless and lost a flesh of light suddenly showed up revealing the leader of the village. Well, at least the true leader, in her eyes, as Suzuki appeared. Suzuki did not respond to any of the calls for help, instead casting summon undead tenth. This allowed him to summon three ninth tier undead instead of the usual single tenth tier one given the enemy's numbers made numbers on, their own side a priority. Alberto had already gone to work using Janungagap to swat away many of the demi-humans like flies. Philip who had unwittingly decided to tag along with them was shrieking like a little girl and trying to make himself look small. Suzuki had summoned three Banshee Oniromancers. Much like the Banshee Queen, they were women with pale skin dressed in rags though of note they each carried mirrors in their hands. They were undead which were more skilled with divination magic rather than offense however given their high levels, they were still able to cast large area of effect spells in order to deal with the oncoming demi-humans. Create mid-tier undead, Suzuki said and that summoned death knights over and over until the uses of one day were completely consumed and an army of death knights sprouted from the corpses of the fallen demi-humans and began to turn the tide quite quickly. He then flew up himself casting chain dragon lightning over and over until finally there were no enemies left. Suzuki was none too happy. To the outsider, Suzuki Sartori looked completely calm. He was the face of the tranquil lake which was absolutely still with no disturbances marring its surface. That is of course if you did not look too closely and if you weren't one such as Albedo, who over time had gotten used to reading her master's expression. As the saying goes still waters run deep and if one were to look closely, one would see that Suzuki's right hand was clenched into a fist as a demonstration of the only outward sign that he was furious. I need fluder paradigm, he muttered under his breath. However, he realized that using the message spell would not work here. For some reason, people in this world did not trust the message spell. He had asked Fluder about this one time, and he had mentioned a country that had completely collapsed from relying on the message spell for too long. Suzuki had never had any such issues in Ygracel, but it just seemed to be another idiosyncrasy of this world. He surveyed the damage as per reports, the casualties to humans were in the single digits. 
Thankfully, though this was because the undead had taken the brunt of the assault, and it had not just been the same here. He was getting reports from New Nazarite as well as Necropolis, which had been similarly attacked. The loss of the undead was not significant enough to cause him or his organization severe harm. Howsoever it pained him still given that he had limited numbers of undead he could create in a day. A possible silver lining could be that he would have new corpses to replace the old, but his escapades in the Beast Men Kingdom had guaranteed that he would not run out of bodies for several decades, so he couldn't even look up on that front. Several Ignanik had been killed and it would take time for him to either breed them back to their old numbers or capture more. He grit his teeth. Above all what hurt him most was the principle of the thing. As for Albedo, the snow-white devil, she had never seen Suzuki so angry. The closest she had ever seen him had been about two months ago, when a group of Nadu wells in some part of the kingdom had decided to appropriate the name of the Eight Fingers for themselves, then masqueraded as people working under Suzuki's organization and were extorting the local businesses and peasants. This was one thing that absolutely pissed Suzuki off, unfortunately, given the fact that he was commanding a criminal organization, it was rather difficult to prove its legitimacy, but that made it all the more necessary to take such imposters out. We at least get one of them alive Suzuki-sama. Albedo herself was full of anger but seeing how angry Suzuki was she had reigned her own in for the time being, it would only do for one of them to be angry. Granted alive was a bit of an exaggeration, given the demi-human state. It had had its right leg and left arm torn out and one of its eyes was gouged out. It was breathing with difficulty it appeared as if several of its ribs had been cracked, but still, it meant Suzuki's criteria for being quote-unquote alive. Dominate, Suzuki said. What are you? He asked. I am a Quagoa of the Po clan. Quagoa? Suzuki asked. Are you demi-humans or heteromorphs? Demi-humans? The creature replied. We live under the Azalija mountain range. Why did you attack us? Suzuki asked coming to the meat of the matter. The animal growled, but the power of the spell compelled it to answer. We were ordered by the clan Lord P. Ryuro to attack the settlement. No other reason was given. How many of you are there? Suzuki asked. In total or just those sent to attack you? The creature responded. The spell didn't remove the target's ability to wisecrack apparently. Albedo nearly took out her weapon and beheaded the thing on the spot but Suzuki told her to calm down. He needed answers. Tell me both, he said. Well, in total, we number 80,000. With 10,000 each in eight different clans. As for those sent to attack you and the surrounding areas. We number 10,000, we are sent here as a vanguard. Oh so, Suzuki said, more, of you are coming? I do not know the further plans of my clan leader though. If I were to hazard against then I would say yes, more of us are coming. So, you do not know the purpose as to why you were sent, Suzuki asked again. No. And what were you ordered to do? Were you ordered to kill us and bring back meat? That was why you humans generally attacked human settlements as humans were a source of food for them during lean times. Most humans did not have the means to protect themselves. They did not have the claws or the fangs or the breath of fire or ice and neither were they like rabbits who could hide underground. Suzuki had even heard stories of the Minotaur kingdom in the past. Humans were kept up livestock essentially while the beast men fought for control over humans as a resource though, now it was not so. As a matter of fact, given what he had heard of the Minotaur kingdom, he was very sure that it would have been a player who had founded the place. No, we are not ordered to bring food. We were ordered to scout the area and to attack to create as much chaos as possible. Nothing more. Suzuki was hardly satisfied with the response. But if even magical means of interrogation could provide only this, it was unlikely that he would get any further information from this thing. He crushed its head with his boot and then wiped the remains on a nearby patch of grass releasing some of his anger. We will still need to get Paradine on board for this, Suzuki said. Also get Camula as well. 
Fluder Paradigm was currently busy. Working on a project of his own, he had seen Suzuki's greater teleportation spell over and over again. And he had made it up in his mind though that if he was to progress in the field of magic, he would want to learn that spell. Given he knew a weaker version of the spell and that countless records on teleportation were available, he wished to reverse engineer the underlying mechanism so that he could finally take a step into the realm of the seventh tier. He had poured countless hours of research into figuring out a proper formula to define the spell, but to no avail up till now, and a knock on his door snapped him, out of his thoughts. This had better be important if they were disturbing him, then again, they already knew that. He was located in one of the bases controlled by the Eighth Fingers. The mere fact that he had been given a rank as one of the six arms was enough to drive fear into the hearts of anyone who heard of the fact. Even those who were unaware of his reputation as the mighty Tri-Arts magic caster of the Empire. In other words, this was likely business-related. And something important at that. He opened the door to see someone he had never seen before. This was not someone who was of the usual help, in other words. As a matter of fact, to Fluder something seemed off about the man. He seemed to radiate mediocrity in some way. No, not mediocrity. It was something worse. He seemed to radiate idiotcy. Then Fluder thought that he could feel his IQ dropping just by looking at the man's face. No. Yt, that had to be an illusion. Of course there's no way the man could be casting some kind of spell or something like that. Surely such magic could not exist in this world. He snapped out of these thoughts and asked the man what he was here for. My name is Sir Philip, the man replied. He did not seem to be of noble birth, but Fluder overlooked that. I carry a message from Suzuki Sotoru. At that name, Fluder immediately changed his demeanor. What does Master Suzuki want of me? Well, he wished for you to come to the courtyard at once there was something he wished to speak to you about. Fluder moved to the courtyard, but why the courtyard specifically? Surely there were better places to have a meeting, which he could set up for his teacher. Oh, well, there's something that he might want to show you out in the courtyard, Philip explained. Fluder finally understood what the man was saying as he finally came upon the courtyard. Whereupon he saw a large frost dragon. As Suzuki gradually calmed down Albedo found herself becoming more agitated. The mere thought that some stinky lowlife demi-humans could have possibly gone ahead and attempted to invade her master's territory. She shook with anger as she took a deep breath. Her master had ordered his undead to go after the remaining Quagoa forces hunting them down into the various spaces and camps they had set up underneath the earth. These efforts have been mostly successful though, given the number of Quagoa it was highly likely that one or two of them would have escaped to tell the tale. Suzuki had tried to interrogate others, but they were of little help. It occurred to him that there was likely someone else behind the attack given the lack of a good reason for the Quagoa to strike at them. Could it be an organization of rivals to him? As it stood, even if there was such an organization of people there was little that they could do to Suzuki. If it got to the point where they outed him to the king Suzuki could simply have him either executed or overthrown. The young Prince Barbaro was deeply indebted to the Eight Fingers and was a very compliant puppet to place on the throne. For now though, Suzuki wanted to gather as much information on his enemies as possible afterwards before launching his counterattack. So Fluda, have you ever seen anything like this? Suzuki asked as he had not seen any kind of demi-human like this within Yggdrasil, and he had not heard of anything of the same from his days as an adventure. Just to be sure he had reached out to some old contacts within the Adventurer's Guild that he had and they too had never seen such a creature. Please forgive me, Suzuki-sama, Fluder, replied. I do not know of such a creature. If I had some time, I could scour the texts of the Empire to find more information regarding them. However, of course you can't right now. Suzuki said, given that Fluder was out of the Empire's good graces. I once again, ask for forgiveness, for my uselessness, Fluder said deeply. Please raise your head. Fluder we can always find more information from some other source, but your wisdom is always appreciated. You give too much praise to this one, Fluder said. All right, Suzuki said. 
gather the other heads of the organization for a meeting. This afternoon, we need a battle plan to deal with these vermin. Understood, Fluder said. After this Suzuki and Albedo teleported back to Necropolis. That was their true hideout. The true stronghold from which they operated their empire, and it was well guarded from divination magic, and so their enemies would have a difficult time spying on them there. It was here that a proper strategy could finally be concocted. The moment Suzuki went into the mayor's room, he grabbed a chair from there and threw it against the wall which smashed into several pieces as though even though he was a magic caster, his strength was still far above that of a normal person. The mayor said nothing to this outburst, though all of his summons could feel Suzuki's rage a drizzle of hatred that added on to their own. He then took a deep breath coming down somewhat. Albedo approached by placing a hand on his shoulder after some hesitation when he didn't withdraw away. She then embraced him from behind and watched his breathing slowly return back to normal. Thank you Albedo, Suzuki said. He then conjured up for himself and another chair and sat down at the table. Several scenarios ran through his mind, but he needed more information before he could act on any of them. He had used magical interrogation on several other Quagoa, but unfortunately, it seemed that none of them knew more than the other one he had interrogated. It also seemed that no humans had ever come into contact with this kind of demi-human before or if they had. They had not lived to tell the tale given how the Quagoa were almost unknown. It wasn't though as if he had not obtained any information at all, however. He was able to understand how the Quagga would work. They were demi-humans who lived under the Azalija mountain range and they were very similar to moles in their diet, which consisted of vegetables, insects, and all matters of other things. So they had no particular predilection for humans. As a matter of fact, they were not the kind of demi-humans who would go around hunting humans for food, which was likely why there were no specific records regarding them. If they had never come into contact or combat with humans, there was no reason for humans to have records of them. It made it all the weirder that they had attacked him. What could they have hoped to gain? He had never heard of this P.E. Ririuro who the Quagoa spoke of. But apparently, he was quite the leader according to the Quagoa he had interrogated. Quagoa grew stronger based on the minerals, they ate as children as such Quagoa society had a hierarchy that was very very much entrenched and difficult to change because say, a Quagoa was born to a noble family, who was rich and able to provide for excellent ores. That Quagoa would be able to grow stronger than the others and given this, it would be able to outperform anyone else and would be able to in turn get better, ores for itself and for its own offspring. They repeated a positive cycle which likewise was a negative cycle if you were born on the lower rungs of the social ladder, however, there were some exceptions to this. Apparently some time ago, this Quagoa by the name of P.E. Ririuro had appeared and he was noted to be very strong, so strong as a matter of fact that the Quagoa he had spoken to had all said that they thought that he could defeat all 80,000 of them if they were to challenge him head on, however, he was still weaker than the Frost Dragon Lord under whom they served. Suzuki had wanted to get more information regarding the Frost Dragon Lord, but was unable to, as most of the Quagoa had never had first-hand contact with him. He tried to verify this information with Hei Jinmal, who said that he had heard of his father's dealing with the Quagoa long before he had been slain, but he had no further information regarding the same as it was the dragons were not too much concerned with the Quagoa given they considered them to be lower life's forms and Hei Jinmal himself did not find them to be very fascinating because they had no great works of art or architecture to admire, unlike the dwarfs. So, now, the question remained regarding how should Suzuki proceed, he could not let such an insult to himself and his organization go unanswered. He would need to attack these Quagoa back. And ideally, have the head of P.E. Ririuro in a box. But he couldn't run into the situation blindly and in anger. He had to always keep in mind, though, that there could be something deeper and more sinister going on. From what he could tell this P.E. Ririuro was a smart person. He had to be in order to have united the 80,000 Quagoa under different commands under his own rule. He also seemed to have some idea of a meritocracy given a rule that he had implemented regarding valuable ores, thereby allowing the Quagga who were less fortunate to get ores for rewards for hard work so that their children could one day rise up the ranks. 
he did not seem to be the kind of person who would attack an enemy without knowing this strength or unprovoked. And it was clear though, that the Quagarai did not have any kind of secret strategy or weapon or magic, which could overcome Suzuki's forces. This made it all the stranger that they had chosen to attack them. And as such there could only be one conclusion that he could reach. The Quagoa were sent by someone else. They're acting as pawns for someone else, Suzuki said. Albedo nodded in agreement. Given that they served the Frost Dragon Lord, who as per Heijinmal had been recently killed, it could only be deduced that it was the Elder Lick who had slain the rest of Heijinmal's family, who had decided to send the Quagoa after him. Of course, there was a second possibility, the possibility being though that once the undead occupied the area, normally occupied by the Frost Dragons the Quagoa were forced out and they were simply looking for a new home, however, that seemed unlikely given what he knew of the Quagoa's biology they would be far more suited for some other region within the mountain ranges, and not on the plains like this. And were this the case, the rest of the tribes would have followed as well. The worst case scenario Suzuki could think of was that the Quagoa were being used by another organization. Perhaps not just delicious, but a group of players, and the goal was to see Suzuki's power and the limit to his resources, manpower, and spells. In other words, the Quagoa had not been sent because whoever had sent them had expected them to succeed in their mission. But rather they had been done to see the extent of Suzuki's power by sending 10,000 soldiers. The enemy had wished to gain a measure of Suzuki's strength, and one thing was clear that they knew where Necropolis was now. As such their hideout was not secure anymore. Suzuki could have moved the city, however, it would have been too much of a pain to do so at this point and for now he would leave it be as possible bait for the enemy. Suzuki's mind went back to his days of playing Yggdrasil. If such a thing had been buying enemy guild, how would he have responded? The answer was simple. He would have sent in a force and ordered them to use minimal magic. He would essentially reflect the enemy's strategy back on them. He would try to obtain as much information on them while revealing as little information on himself as he could. Suzuki scratched his chin. All right, so Albedo, this is what we have to do. We need more information but first of all, we need to contact the Adventurer's Guild. He needed to speak with the Guild Master and see if there were any records of these demi-humans. It was highly likely though, that at some point, some adventurers had come across them and as such there would be some records that he could access. After that, he would need to send an army after the Quagoa. It would also have to be large and formidable enough to succeed against the enemy. But at the same time, small enough that it would not tip away Suzuki's hand. And he knew just the group for the job.